Greetings and welcome to the Paths of Pollen podcast, episode two, which will cover some parts of chapter one of the book, Paths of Pollen. For a natural history subject like pollination, my mind went right to, well, where did it start? You can't really sort of talk about anything to do with biology without getting into evolution. And, and so the origin story was kind of a natural place to begin for me. And there turns out to be a great place to look into exactly that on the Canadian East Coast. This is Joggins. The Joggins Fossil Cliffs. This one's got a fossil on it. Right here. So I, I was lucky enough to attend the walking tour at the, at the Joggins Fossil Cliffs. She rolls on the beach, you're allowed to take water, one glass. This is actually a very famous place. It's, it's a place where many groundbreaking discoveries in paleontology were made. And this, this particular site is, is incredibly valuable. It's a remnant of one of the earliest forests to ever exist, which means, among other things, the story of land plants oh, you found a fossil. is right there. There's, that's where a root is laying. From the beginning to, well, the end of the Carboniferous, the Permian extinction. Exactly like this one. Yeah. The Carboniferous was a geologic period which spanned roughly 60 million years, from around 358 million years ago to the Permian period, when the world experienced its first mass extinction. During that 60 million years or so, plants and animals first started living on land. This was so long ago, the continents were different. And, and the land itself was different. Picture nothing but bare rock for millions of years. Eventually, that was colonized by mossy little plants, which over time shot up into super tall, weird-looking trees, which we don't see today, at least as trees, because they've all gone extinct. Along with giant trees, there were giant invertebrates, like Meganeura. Picture a dragonfly with a two-foot wingspan. And Arthropleura, a relative of millipedes, well, an ancestor of millipedes, that was two meters long. The fossils at the Joggins Cliffs take us back to that ancient time of weird trees and giant bugs. Now, right here, I think we're going to slip over and go back in time a little bit before we head south. Remember, every step we take, every kilometer is a million years. So, this all was very. I'm going to give you some of the one hour walking tour we did with, uh, with Dana Brown, um, a, uh, a kind of a guide and educator for, uh, for the Joggins Fossil Center. Like I said, this is a secondary route here. And look, you can tell the car. And you'll hear me snapping some pictures. Okay, a lot of pictures during the tour. So yes, that's my noisy camera. The miners called them stone snakes. They didn't know what they were. Dana Brown comes from Generations of Nova Scotians. He personally recalls using fossil tree roots as doorstops. I'll always know them as a Joggins doorstop. Everybody here, if you go in the old houses, they all use them for doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was a little kid, that was the first one I remember. Was running around one thing that was missing from that one hour tour was the presence of a, a palynologist, someone who studies uh, spore and pollen fossils. What is doing, like, sort of like. Uh, is there a palynologist coming around? Yeah, she's in Sackville at Mount A. It's so hard to get across the border. She's, she's only here about, she's working from home a lot right now. Now, I, I went on the tour in 2021 when the uh, COVID pandemic was in full swing and that put a real chill on international travel. But besides that, uh, the palynologist wasn't necessarily going to be there performing field work. In any case, that particular piece I didn't really get firsthand. So I'm going to try to fill in that part of the story with some parts from the book where I attempt to describe the origins of pollen, which has been studied quite a lot around Joggins, you know, other times when palynologists actually made it to the site. But anyway, no problem. 
while I was there, I got a wonderful sense of what it was like to walk around a Carboniferous forest, or as best as I could kind of parse that, walking along a beach littered with fossils. And you can kind of feel it. You can kind of feel 300 million years of history lying around there. It is actually a very special place. And that long ago, all the world's continents were shoved together into one single landmass, Pangaea. And the Appalachian Mountains were, were looming nearby, higher than the Himalayas. They would be towering over both sides of us. And they had huge river channels coming off them. And these river channels are the old reefs that you see out here. They had water running on them for so long, it left them super hard sandstone. And that was the first industry here. When you go up, look on our lawn, and you'll see a five-ton grindstone lying on the lawn. They cut grindstones out of them. Tourists can wander rocky beaches at the foot of these cliffs and see fossilized tree trunks jutting from cliff faces. That's a tree. Oh, yeah. This one probably was about six meters. And you can see one right up. If you look straight in, oh, right, there, right, right there. on its side. And just from last Sunday, look at these three that come out. Two here, one here. This one hasn't fallen in. They're just like they were when they were laid down. This would be a whole thicket of them, just like they grow today. Some former trees are petrified hollow stumps where early reptiles once laid eggs. And you can see the hollow tree. Mm -hmm. See him living and going down into it? Mm -hmm. And yeah, this tree, it was very pithy, very soft on the inside. So when they got a certain height, they snap off in a storm. And the inner part would rot out very quickly. What you're left with was the mold for this tree, a hollow tree, the bark standing in the swamp. So the imprint you see here is actually the imprint of the inside of the bark that went around and held this into position until it solidified. Is, is that in the, in the museum they got like lizards living inside? Of course, I yeah. was just going to say, you wouldn't go to Florida and stick your hand in a hollow tree. Right, yeah. Right? Mm. That was something nasty. And uh, same is true. Our first creatures like Holonymus and Dendropupa would use the hollow tree for a home. First flood he's trapped, second flood he's there for us. Joggins is famous for many groundbreaking discoveries in paleontology, including the discovery of Holonymus, one of the earliest reptiles, one of the earliest egg-laying land animals. Coal mine point, that's where the first reptile was found, Holonymus. Holonymus is only 10 centimeters long. Okay. Holonymus lila. This little extinct lizard became a keystone in the Oxford debates where Charles Darwin and other scholars were trying to prove the validity of evolution. Before Holonymus, all there were were primitive amphibians. Holonymus was the first amphibian. It was the first one that could lay a terrestrially adapted egg. And that doesn't sound like much to us. We eat them every day, right? Yeah. But in evolution, it was huge. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say much more about egg-laying reptiles since that's not really the focus of the book or of this podcast. However, I, I am going to get into another kind of chicken and egg story, and I'm stretching the terminology here because I'm talking about pollen, and pollen isn't really an egg, but stay with me here. It, it's kind of a shell with something alive and squishy inside. Pollen was a big step in plant evolution, but there were many steps before that. I mean, like plants had to grow stems and leaves and then eventually they just sort of shot up into into giant trees which all grew from spores which is which is all there was before there was seeds before there was pollen and we're not even getting into flowers there were never flowers in the carboniferous those didn't come along until until the time of dinosaurs actually 200 million years after the carboniferous period but in Joggins, if you looked really close, and I mean close with a microscope, you can see kind of embedded in these sandstone cliffs, you can see spores and seeds 
and fossils of pollen from some of the earliest plants with pollen. And you know how when you look at things under a microscope, even familiar things, they look weird and unfamiliar, and, and your imagination does its best to make sense of what you're looking at, which is what happened to me when I took a look at photos of pollen fossils extracted with coring drills from the Joggins Cliffs. And, and here, I'll, I'll just give you this part from the book. My imagination does strange things when I try to make sense of grainy, grayscale images that were photographed through microscope lenses. One image makes me recall fuzzy tabloid pictures I once saw of triangular UFOs. At its true scale, the object in the photo could fly right over my city and I'd never notice since it's only 50 microns or 0.05 millimeters across. Another specimen is roughly spherical and spiked with numerous blunt points. Massively enlarged, it could pass for a World War II naval mine. Scaled down, it might be the new variant of some flu-like virus. Shown actual size, the spiky ball would look like a pebble next to a boulder if you put it beside a grain of sand. These cryptic objects are in fact fossils of plant spores extracted from one of the most intact relics of Carboniferous forest on Earth. Oh, that's a tree. That's a straight up tree. Oh, Remember, that's standing in situ, straight up and down. 300 million years of tectonic, volcanic. Okay. These are all in place, and that's what makes the huge difference. Okay. The Joggins Fossil Cliffs are now in the Bay of Fundy, where they encounter the world's highest tides. The beach beneath the cliffs, where I've joined a guided tour, will be underwater an hour later. So look at that reef. We came down the steps you could walk to. Big reef out here. And you can't get near it now. As high tides lap at the cliff face, it erodes, dislodging fossils which tumble out. Big tides last week. Now before, the last tour I did down here, you could only see this. Mm. Wow. So we knew it was a root. But those big tides flipped it right over. Yeah, yeah, Look at the massive. Now that's, that's a, a monster. Doorstop. Right? <laughs> the beach is strewn with fossil fragments, like smashed pottery, which were embedded in the cliff face until they came tumbling down. And so gravity and erosion did the trick on them. When some of the bigger pieces came down, their impacts could be quite dramatic. But this just came down. It just, the whole, it just a sense of shockwave right through the beach. <laughs> you, the piece of that lands on you, there's trouble. We always have first, second year geology students. They're the only place I've seen a rock fall and everybody runs to it. Mm. <laughs> Most people run away. But yeah, yeah, yeah. They know the new Things that were once alive, kept their shapes through a process called permineralization, through which rock replaced their tissues cell by cell. When you go to Arizona, or Yellowstone, the one that you see there is called, they call it petrified, but we call it permineralized. In geology is called permineralization. It's one cell at a time is taken over by a mineral. That's why they're so beautiful. They gleam and shine. And where it's one cell at a time, you can read the dendrochronology. The rings are in it. We pick up pieces of permineralized tree bark to marvel at them, and then put them back. No souvenir hunting is permitted. So, so if we see a fossil, we give it to you? Or we just leave it on? We just leave it. Okay. We're actually nominated to be in a natural site in UNESCO, so everything comes out of the bank naturally. It goes back naturally, which I take some heat for, for sure. Because there's some nice ones, but... And unless it's anything important, then, like if it's a reptile, we'll be running up those steps. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's been here for, like before I started here. Only it was way up here. It's working its way out, though. Big tree, big sigillaria. Sigillaria are from a class of 
plants called lycopsids, which are still around today, but not nearly as gigantic as ancient lycopsids, like sigillaria, which grew as high as 50 meters uh, or 160 feet. Instead of bark, like modern trees have, sigillaria had a tough outer layer uh, like scales, and, and these look very distinctive in fossils of the tree. But also, while it's extinct, some sigillaria trees are still standing, believe it or not, like the one Dana Brown points out to us, which is jutting out from the cliff face like, a, like an ancient Greek pillar. He also shows us fossils from another lycopsid, Lepidodendron. And they're the triangle trees. You see the triangle like scales on them? Some of these clay-colored shards have thorny diamond shapes like flattened pineapple skins. They were once the bark of trees that looked like 50-meter dust mops Isn't that beautiful? with long, complicated-sounding names. They're, they're all long in Latin, like if you were going to get your prescription. Dendron just means like rhododendron. Dendron means tree. And it's scale. Lipido means scale. So it's really just scale tree. See, that piece, when I was here, this piece was sitting on here. Mm -hmm. See, it's washed, it's, the, the water's tore it off, and now I can see the whole root. It's crazy how it's always evolving. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. Can you think of fossils as being, like, stuck in time? Not so much. He, he's stuck in time, all right. Yeah, You're but... Right. 300 million. discovery of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're the first... Can you imagine, like, we're the first people to see that in 300 million years. Mm -hmm. Some of the first people yeah. to see this. And the only thing really left of these today a little quill wart, little club mosses. They're only this big. Lepidodendron's much shorter descendants, the club mosses, are nicknamed ground pines for their needle shaped leaves. Club mosses are not pines, nor are they mosses. They are from an ancient lineage that spawned some of the first trees and possibly the first vascular plants. Plants with stems that contain specialized tissues called xylem, which draws water upward, and phloem, which moves nutrients around like vessels transport blood. Without this internal plumbing, no plants, certainly not trees, could ever grow tall. Trees in the Carboniferous further supported their fantastic growth with lignin and cellulose, which made them woody, like all trees ever since. On the beach at Joggins, we pick up preserved bark that's textured like corduroy. This was the skin of Calamites, another primeval tree. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, that's a Calamites. That's a horsetail. Oh, yeah, it certainly is. Yeah, there you go. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Let's run up the hill. <laughs> no, not for that one, no. And that's still here today. It's one of my favorites because it still has a relative here today. It's called uh, the horsetail, mm -hmm. the scouring rush. You mm -hmm. see it in all the gardens. Mm -hmm. Only back then it grew 10 meters high. The Acadia, they used to call it the scouring rush. They used it for pots and pans. Mm -hmm. So it was like the first uh, SOS pan. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you see the segmentation and the striation in it. But even present-day horsetails look out of their time, with their, their ridged stems and, and their toothy, up-curving shoots. They definitely look like primitive plants. One less visible sign of their prehistoric nature is a lack of pollen. Their towering ancestors, Calamites, existed before pollen or seeds could evolve. Instead, Calamites propagated with spores, as horsetails still do. In their reproductive phase, horsetails are crowned with brown, club-shaped growths called sporangiophores, which are covered in clusters of spores. The spores themselves are tiny spheres with ribbon-like appendages called elaters, which coil and uncoil, reacting to small changes in moisture. This unconscious flexing powers a spastic sort of motion. 
The spores seem to walk, even jump at times. A few centimeters at most, but enough to catch wind currents and ride them short distances. When horsetail spores finally walk, sail, or bounce someplace with adequate light and moisture, they germinate into spiky green mini plants called gametophytes. Though they all started as asexual spores, each tiny plant could end up male, female, or hermaphroditic. Their job is to produce male or female sex cells called gametes. Male gametes behave very much like animal sperm. They have tails and they swim through droplets of water, blindly seeking female gametes to fertilize. Should fertilization succeed, an asexual plant called a sporophyte will germinate, grow tall, and release spores. For primeval plants such as horsetails, spores are like small, simple seeds, or propagules. Each spore contains a single cell, which will generate an entire new plant. This cell is kept safe by a shell made of a tough material called sporopollenin. One botanist called this natural polymer the most resistant organic material of direct biological origin found in nature. Spore shells are tough enough to stay intact for millions, if not hundreds of millions of years. There are millions of fossilized spores embedded in the sandstone cliffs at Joggins. And if you keep searching, if you keep looking deeper, you'll, you'll find even older spore fossils, and older ones still, the deeper you go. Sediments tell stories this way. The past is buried under what came after it. In the case of Joggins during the Carboniferous, this gradual burying happened in a wet, muddy swamp with a river running through it. On a four-hour tour, I could take you out and show you the fossilized log jams in those channels. So it would jam up the channel and it would flood the entire basin. Then very gently, a layer of sediment would come out, just like in any flood. Only it was day in, day out, over and over. And look. Every layer you see is another flooding event. Now that's why the fossilization was so great, because it wasn't violent. It was just flood after flood after gentle flood, covering everything every day. Layer by layer, these enduring particles drop hints about plant evolution. At points, they reveal major breakthroughs, such as when pollen started appearing. This signals a serious leap forward for plant reproduction. Pollen grains resemble spores in many ways. They have tough shells of sporopollenin, and they come in many interesting shapes. However, the job pollen does is different. Instead of sprouting into a plant, it supplies sperm to fertilize a plant's female organ, the ovule. This union produces a plant embryo and a layer of starchy tissue around it called endosperm, what will be a new plant's built-in food supply. The ovule's outer skin hardens into a seed coat. The total construct is a seed. There are fossils of the first pollen-producing seed plants at Joggins. Seed ferns are another dead lineage. There are no more around, but if you reverse time and looked at them, you'd see something like ferns sprouting from tree trunks. So you'll find uh, seed, yeah, all kinds of ferns make, make it up. Mm -hmm. But back then they were seed ferns. Right. Yeah, yeah, just incredible. These extinct plants are called seed ferns, but they were not ferns despite their fern-like leaves. At least the seed part is accurate, since they grew from seeds. There are fossils of those seeds, which resemble petrified nuts. You're in the gallery, I'll show you. Sorry. When they were viable, the seeds contained living plants preparing to sprout. In a sense, pollen grains shelter versions of tiny plants themselves. The cells 
inside them are highly reduced versions of male gametophytes, the single-sexed plants that sprout from spores. The gametophytes within pollen shells have no leafy parts, but they do produce sperm. No one knows how abbreviated male plants got into spore-like shells, but Fossils of primitive pollen hint at the stages early pollen evolved through. Strictly speaking, pollen from seed ferns is not completely pollen, say evolutionary botanists. They call it pre-pollen because it lacked some features of what they call true pollen. Receptacles for this primitive pollen were more basic too. Pollen grains for seed ferns fell into female vessels more like cups than flowers. And the seed ferns' male flowers were just longish sacks dangling from leaves. Despite the coming of pollen, no flowering plants bloomed during the Carboniferous. However, some plants evolved cones. The class of trees known as conifers still exchanged pollen this way. Present-day conifers, such as jack pines, eastern white pines, and balsam firs, occupy forests near the Joggins Cliffs. Their male cones have features called scales, which resemble roof shingles. The scales open up to discharge pollen, which wind carries off. Pollen grains from modern pines are weirdly intricate. Each grain has two hollow bladders to keep it airborne. When one of these bulging pollen grains falls into a female cone, it slowly extends a hollow tail, its pollen tube, and sends sperm to one of the cone's ovules, which hold the plant's version of eggs. When pine ovules grow into seeds, female cones expose them by opening their scales. These exposed seeds are not enclosed by fruit, like seeds from flowering plants, they're naked to the world. Conifers are called gymnosperms, which means naked seed in Latin. The oldest known fossils of pine pollen were found in a gypsum quarry near the town of Windsor, Nova Scotia. They're 140 million years old, which is young by Joggin's standards. Uh, yeah, that's nice, that's a cordate leaf. And that's for a tree that grew higher up in the elevation. And it was one of our first gymnosperms, or our first relatives of our conifers. Big strap like corn leaves on it. So you can see what I mean by that. It looks like, to me, I always called them a Roman gladius, because they kind of look like a gladius. But a lot of them had huge needles, right? Because they had 20% more oxygen. And their needles were way bigger. And then over time, when the oxygen levels dropped, they evolved to have billions of little needles take in more oxygen like we see today. Fossil pollen grains from more primitive gymnosperms are found in the Joggins Cliffs. These don't have fancy extras like aerodynamic bladders. Their appearance is decidedly simpler. Pollen from one extinct conifer genus, Patanosporides, looks like a half-eaten hard candy mashed into a date. Ilanides unicus, another extinct tree species, had pollen grains like oblong rocks. These early conifers perished, along with seed ferns, in the Permian mass extinction 250 million years ago. During this unprecedented die-off, 95% of marine life and 70% of life on land ceased to exist. In the lead up to this tragedy, volcanic eruptions caused by continental movement saturated the air with greenhouse gases. Runaway global warming likely laid waste to the trees at Joggins. The ruins of this forest do not hold many intact remains. Even before the Permian die-off, time took its toll. There were storms and, and fires, like in modern forests. Trees sometimes pitched over because of top heaviness and shallow roots. Maybe they were crushed by their titanic siblings when those fell on them afterward. 
In any case, these fallen giants lay where they fell, unable to rot away since bacteria hadn't yet evolved to decompose wood. Time marched on, and sediments buried them over 300 million years. Very few of those trees came through all of that in one piece. However, pollen and spores remained intact. These tough little grains are sometimes the only evidence certain plants ever lived. This makes them fascinating to a subset of researchers called palynologists, who study spore and pollen fossils. You'll recall I mentioned them at the top of the show. These scientists are paleontologists, but not the kind who unearth huge beasts like mastodons and dinosaurs. Nothing these fossil hunters collect measures more than a couple of millimeters. To reach microscopic fossils embedded in rock takes powerful drills like those used for coal exploration. The term carboniferous, coined in 1822, means coal bearing, since four tenths of all coal can be traced to this geologic period. Brittle chunks of soft bituminous coal litter the beach at Joggins. They, they crumble when I pick them up. What about this? That is coal. That's a big coal seam right here. Oh. That big black coal seam. We go around, and even coal it is a sedimentary rock. Always organic, and you can see it has like a sheen on it. If it was in the sunlight, and that's kerosene. That's what makes coal burn. It's the kerosene in it. These seams of coal go right back to Spring Hill. Okay. Uh, I live in the Spring Hill Formation. This is called Dana Dog. Brown, who, who comes from a coal mining family, has plenty of stories about the coal mining community that prospected coal seams, which are, are still plainly visible in the cliffs. They followed the seams. That's the only way they could find them. There was no geology. So the people sailed around, and if they could spot a seam in the bank, then they followed that seam wherever it went. More than 60 coal deposits can be counted along the entire cliff face. Dana Brown points to burnt orange patches where disgruntled coal workers protesting mine closures in 1961 set fire to coal seams. You see a lot of these too, these are from 61. These gray and orange rocks. In 61, the older guys went down and they set fire to the seams out of revenge. They never got any pension, anything. And the fire, the big coal seams burnt through the bank and all the gray clay around it, it superheated it into terracotta. See, when I grew up here, in the, it still was smoldering. It smelled like sulfur. Wow. There is so much coal in this fossil forest because coal is made from forest. Yeah, well, that's where the bark turned to coal. Yeah. Oh, but you wow. see the imprint. Of, that's yeah. probably where the top of the tree snapped off and then oh, wow. floated down through yeah. and left its imprint here. There's a nice piece of clam coal. That's after the coal gets washed out of it. Don't forget, wherever you go, if you find coal, you'll find fossils. They go together like this. I had a Scottish professor. I couldn't understand a word the guy said. And he came in one morning, and he said, yeah, no, he said, coal. Coal, he said, is very much like a marriage. He said, a lot of time and a lot of pressure. <laughs> Over time, trees and other plants transformed into peat and then into coal. Coal halfway through the process. In Ireland, they dig it out. It's called peat. peat. And that's when it doesn't finish. But it still has methane in it, so they use it still to heat and cook. While they were alive, Carboniferous plants pulled so much CO2 from the air that the so-called coal age had 15% more oxygen than now. Much of that age's stored carbon is now back in the atmosphere. In 2021, the World Energy Agency calculated that coal supplies a third of the world's power and contributes 72% of its fossil fuel emissions. Some palynologists help coal companies find this combustible rock. The distinct shapes of spore and pollen fossils reveal which plants became coal in ancient peat mires, 
experts use this knowledge to predict coal quality. They call they have better coal. It's called anthracite, mm -hmm. and it's very hard, very high in in the kerosene, and a lot cleaner. But there's no such thing as clean coal. Microfossils point the way to fossil fuels. Oil companies have their own uses for palynology. They keep palynologists on staff to make on-site determinations about where to drill based on microfossils of ancient plant and marine life. The viscous tar-like liquid called bitumen from Alberta's oil sands formed at the bottom of inland seas. These waters once deluged Western Canada during the Cretaceous period around 100 million years ago. There are many dinosaur fossils in Alberta documenting their presence during that period. After the Cretaceous, dinosaurs that did not become birds dropped out of existence. Flowers, on the other hand, had just gotten started. And also, this podcast is just getting started with flowers as well. In upcoming episodes, you'll hear a lot more about flowers and pollinators and pollen, of course, from many different perspectives, including the uh, pollinator's perspective and actually the flower's perspective, believe it or not. And, and the next episode in particular, um, we're going to be looking at how flowers are perceived and how pollinators perceive them. Even we could possibly even venture to say perhaps how uh, flowers uh, perceive pollinators. Anyway, uh, stay tuned for more of that. Uh, I hope you check it out. Bye for now.